So we showed this estimate for the, this lower bound of the UMD constant of finite dimension L1. So actually what we wanted to prove was this. Uh, let's say C log N. So we have logarithmic blow up in the UMD constants. You can do this for any P between one and infinity. I think if you look at this proof, I don't think any of the constants actually depend on P. I'm pretty sure they don't. Yeah. So this constant C here doesn't depend on P. The way that I stated the theorem, I said for all P, there exists constant C actually. There exists a constant C such that for all P, this is true. And because of these, because of the P independence of the UMD property, I mean, we haven't said anything about how the, the constant varies in P, just that if it's finite for one P, it's finite for all P between one and infinity. It will blow up as it approaches one or infinity, but I've said nothing about that rate. Some things can be said about this, but not in this course, it's a bit too hard. Isn't the kahan kinchin estimate uh, dependent on P? It is, but actually we didn't use the P in that. So the place where we used kahan kinchin was here. And that was just in comparing a scalar valued L1 ah, right okay. average with the square function. So there's no, there is a constant, but it's nothing to do with P. Okay, thanks. All of the L, yeah, sorry, like all of the LP character is in the dependence on omega and it, nothing depends on omega in the end. So yeah, P doesn't actually appear here. But this, this logarithmic blow up, I mean, th this is not a sharp result. This says that it blows up, but you can say more than that. This is just like the first result you can prove. If you work harder, you can prove more than this. I think, I think logarithmic blow up is optimal in some sense, but you can control it more than that. This is really just, yeah, first approximations to results. Let's move on. We want to show that L1 is not UMD and this isn't actually that because all of these spaces are still UMD spaces, right? So let's state the theorem, let's prove it. Take a measure space S. And let's make the assumption that L1 of S is infinite dimensional. Because of course you can have finite dimensional L1 spaces. Then L1 of S is not UMD. And the way you prove this is by embedding finite dimensional L1 spaces into it and saying, okay, the UMD constant is controlled from below by the UMD constants of these subspaces. And it's not a difficult proof. I mean, when I say embed a finite dimensional L1 into a infinite dimensional L1, you can pretty much figure out how to do that. I just want to be a bit explicit. Um, so let's suppose N is in N. And since the dimension of L1S is greater than or equal to N, well, it's infinity, but you know, it's greater than or equal to N, certainly. There exist pairwise disjoint sets, E1, E2, blah, 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 En, that are in the sigma algebra, such that they have positive finite measure. You can get out your measure theory book, or you can just prove it by hand. This is equivalent to having dimension greater than or equal to N. You have to be able to find n disjoint positive measure sets and finite measure sets. And we can take our embedding um, from the n-dimensional L1 space, we call it I to n, say. So embedding the n-dimensional L1 into L1s, we'll send a sequence into this function here. Take the elements of the sequence, normalize them by the measures of these sets and then multiply by the characteristic functions of those sets. Here's a perfectly good isometric embedding of L1n into L1s. It's clearly linear. And for the isometric property, let me write it a little bit clearer. I'm in too much of a rush. It's easy enough to see this is an isometry because these sets EI are disjoint. So when you integrate the sum of these characteristic functions, it just becomes the sum of the integrals of each of these terms. This is N, there's a measure of that set. These cancel out and yeah, that's the L1 norm of the sequence.
So this is an isometry. And thus you have that any of your UMD constants, let's take the UMD2 constant just completely arbitrarily. UMD2 constant of L1S is greater than or equal to the UMD constant of the corresponding subspace, or at least the thing that is isometric to that corresponding subspace. And that's greater than or equal to a constant times log 2n. And this is true for all n. So the only possibility is that that UMD constant is actually infinity. All right. That's not a hard proof. I just thought I'd make it explicit. At least making the some choice of embedding of L1, n dimensional L1 into the space L1s. I wanted to make that explicit. The reason I wanted to do that is there are a bunch of exercises where you prove that certain spaces are not UMD. And the way to do it is to find the right embedding of finite dimensional L1 spaces or finite dimensional L infinity. We haven't done that, but you can also do that. Sometimes the choice of embedding is not obvious, but if you can find an isometric embedding of a family of you know, finite dimensional spaces with blowing up UMD constant into your space and that space is not UMD. This is one of the main techniques of proving something's not UMD. The other technique, which we're going to do here, corollary, I forgot how to spell corollary. Let's just write core. That's how you spell it, right? Corollary, the following spaces are not UMD. We proved L1, infinite dimensional L1 is not UMD, and that automatically gives you a bunch of non UMD spaces for free, essentially. For example, L infinity. provided that it's infinite dimensional. You also have C0, that's not UMD. I'll, I'll prove it, but the proof's not so hard. Um, space M of K where, let's write what this is. K is a compact Hausdorff space compact house of topological space with infinitely many points. M of K is the Borel measures of bounded variation with the variation norm. I think we called this M of K earlier in the lectures, but that is not the only name for this space, of course. Also C of K, K is above. This is the space of continuous functions on your compact house or space with the sup norm or the max norm in this case, because a continuous function on a compact space does attain its maximum. So yeah, all of these spaces are not UMD. The proof of that what we use is this fact that a space is UMD if and only if it's dual space is UMD, which we proved a while back. So we know that L infinity of S is the dual space of L1. And L1 is not UMD when S is when S is such that these spaces are infinite dimensional. L1 is not UMD, so L infinity is not UMD. Uh, for C0, the dual of C0 is L1 on the natural numbers. It's infinite dimensional, it's not UMD, right? So it follows that C0 is not UMD either. For M of K, you have to think a little bit harder. There exists a measure. Well, okay, there's more than one proof of this fact, but there exists a measure in, in M of K such that L1 with respect to that measure actually embeds into M of K. Take for example, your space has infinitely many points. So let's take some like infinite sum of Dirac masses or something like that associated to those points. And then all of the counting measures on that set of points will be will have bounded variation if, if you look at it the right way. Anyway, you'll get an infinite dimensional L1 sitting inside your space, which says that M of K is not UMD. 
As I said, there are other ways of seeing this, but that's true. And as for C of K, you know that the dual of C of K is M of K. So this is according to Wikipedia, Reese Markov Kakutani. It's one of the Reese representation theorems, but I guess he wasn't the only one to prove it or they weren't the only ones to prove it. If it was both of the brothers, I think it was just one of them. Don't know which Reese this was. Anyway, that's the whole proof. It's just straightforward duality consequences. Once L1 is not UMD, anything you can build from that by duality is not UMD either. Simple. So now what do we know about UMD spaces? LP is UMD when P is between one and infinity and it's not UMD at the endpoints. And this is what you should think of as, I guess, typical behavior for UMD spaces. You might have some nice reflexive spaces in a whole range and then at the ends, the UMD property breaks down. Whether or not this is truly typical behavior is a somewhat open of a question. For people that watched my talk the other week, I mentioned this intermediate UMD conjecture. It relates to that. So. Whether or not UMD is sort of an intermediate type property or whether you can have extremal UMD spaces is yeah, pretty much wide open. Okay. What are we gonna do in the rest of the, the lecture? We'll talk about Burkholder's inequalities. <coughs> so, you know I'm not a probabilist by now, but apparently um, when you're doing martingales, you have square function estimates for martingales that are important. Tim's nodding, so I assume I'm correct. And um, you have the sort of thing in harmonic analysis as well, of course. You've got square function estimates for functions. You've got the Littlewood-Paley theorem that says the LP norm of a function is the LP norm of its associated Littlewood-Paley square function. Um, Burkholder's inequalities are the, the Barnack value, or not even just Barnack value, the, the Martingale version of that. How do you estimate the LP norm of a Martingale in terms of some square function? I'll state the theorem and it will make more sense. Burkholder's inequalities. Burkholder developed a lot of the UMD theory. He was a probabilist so far as I know but I don't know too much about his work other than the stuff to do with UMD. So yeah, if you have a Barnack space X, X is UMD if and only if you have the following estimates. For all P in the reflexive range, for all LP bounded martingales F dot on some probability space valued in X, what do we want? So the LP norm of a martingale is kind of the supremum of LP norms. Okay, so we have LP bounded martingale. So we know this quantity is finite here. The supremum of LP norms along the martingale. What Burkholder's inequalities say is that that is equivalent up to a, a constant depending on P and X. That's equivalent to the norm of its different sequence in the Rademacher space valued in LP valued in X. So to write out what this norm is, in case you forgot, you take a Rada marker average over all N. That's an N here. This function's in LP. I should say epsilon is a Rada marker sequence on some probability space. We call it omega prime because it's not necessarily the same space as the omega we're working with here. F is defined on omega. We take the Rademacher norm like this because by convention, we took the L2 average, although equivalently you could take any LP average you liked here by Kahn Kinchin. <coughs> so this is quite useful. It says that the LP norm of a martingale in this sense can be directly evaluated in terms of its different sequences. And often it's easier to work with the, the different sequence of a martingale than with the martingale itself.
And furthermore, the validity of this estimate is actually equivalent to the UMD property. Not only does UMD imply this, this is the UMD property. So let's start by supposing X is UMD and proving the inequalities. And then later on, we'll come back and show that they imply UMD. We'll start by estimating the different sequence. So first, just for convenience, we're gonna say that this Rademacher average or this Rademacher norm is actually the supremum over all N of finite Rademacher averages, which I think is an exercise in the notes somewhere. It's, it's obvious in a sense, but. So we just take the truncated sequence of differences going up to capital N and we take the finite Rademacher norm of that. So we only use finite Rademacher averages to test this thing. Then by Kahan Kinchin, their names are too long. This is equivalent to the supremum over N, constant depending on P of a double integral over the two probability spaces that we're dealing with. of this Rademacher average. So we have Rademacher variables in omega prime, Martin-Gell difference in omega, LP integral, integrate with respect to the two probability spaces like that. This is just changing, it's using Kahn Kinchin to change the L2 average to an LP average. So you have an LP norm of an LP norm. So you can just write that as a double integral. So then we look at what's happening on the inside here. What we do is we actually fix omega prime. I should make this um, a little bit bigger. We're looking at this part here, fixing omega prime and then looking at the integrand. So for each omega prime, for each n, we're gonna use that x is umd and we'll estimate this integral on the inside. Just that part, no integral in omega prime. And what do we see? This is a sequence of signs. We're not doing any averaging. We just have a fixed sequence of signs. And this is precisely the sort of thing we can estimate using the UMD property. So this is less than or equal to the UMD constant of X to the P the LP UMD constant because we have an LP integral. And this I can simply write as F of N, capital N. Like that. I'll just write that a bit more explicitly. That's the LP norm of FN to the P. So it's just, Write it as a double integral and use the UMD property on the inside because when you have an average over all choices of signs, you can ignore the average and you can say for every possible choice of signs here, I've got control. I've got, you get control on average because you've got control at every point. You actually have something stronger here. So then you integrate over omega prime and you get that the Rademacher norm of the difference sequence is controlled up to some constants depending on P and X, UMD constant in particular, by the supremum of the norms of the elements of the Martin girl. There, that's one estimate. Uh, as for the other direction, showing that the norm of the Martin girl is controlled by the Rademacher norm, Again, you have an estimate for all omega prime, for all n. So we're doing this pointwise thing again that we're gonna average. But now we don't have the Rademacher variables in here. 
this is what we need to control. How do we control this by a rata marker norm? There's no rata marker variables in here, right? And this is a nice little trick that gets used quite a lot. Sure, there's no rata marker variables in here, but there is a one there and we can write one as plus or minus one squared. <laughs> You can just smuggle in a rata marker sequence where there wasn't one, no problem at all. So you've got a sequence of signs times the same sequence of signs. So you can take out one of those sequences using the UMD property and have the other one left over. What's technically being used here is that this quantity here is actually the, the difference of a different martingale, F prime, at omega. Like if you take the different sequences of a martingale and you multiply them by arbitrary signs, you still have a martingale difference sequence. That doesn't change. Of course, for the UMD property to apply, this DFN can't be some arbitrary sequence. It has to be a martingale difference sequence. In this case, it still is. So you do that and then you just reverse the argument from before. First, the previous argument, average over mega prime, use Kahan, Kichin and so on, and you get the reverse estimate. You can also take the supremum over N there. And that's it. So that's Burkholder's estimates, assuming X is UMD. There's still a converse to do. Assume Burkholder's estimates and prove the UMD property. It turns out to be quite easy. You fix a sequence of signs. Uh, you've got your X valued Martingale, X valued LP bounded, Martingale, sorry for all the abbreviations, but I can't be bothered writing out the full words. And we take this Martingale difference sequence or this transformed Martingale difference sequence that we need to estimate. And now how do we estimate this? Well, we have Burkholder's inequalities and we know this is a Martingale difference sequence by the argument that I said before, if I take your difference sequence DF and then I multiply each term by Xi n, that's also a Martingale difference sequence. So by the assumed Burkholder inequality, I get up to a constant depending on P and X or just some constant C. The rata marker norm of that different sequence. Um, yeah, I've got an N here, so this is over N. These are all plus or minus one. And I have the contraction principle that says I can take those out of Radamaka sums for free. No constant because they're all plus or minus one. And again, we have the other side of Burkholder. Burkholder is a, a two-sided inequality. That's the supremum over N, but I don't need the supremum here. This is F sub N in LP. Technically, it's the supremum over n going from n equals one to capital N, but by the contraction properties of conditional expectations, that is actually the capital N term. The norms only increase as you go along the sequence. So the supremum is the last one, if you have a last one. Right, that's the OMD property. Huh, that's it. <laughs> that was all. Actually, once you have all the machinery that we've got, Burkholder's inequalities are practically trivial. Right. You need like Kahan Kinchin, which is pretty heavy. Like that proof was not simple. We needed John Nirenberg to sorry, John Nirenberg to prove that. That took a whole lecture, right? It took half a lecture to prove Kahan Kinchin from that. Like I had this whole section on Rademacher averages purely so that we can use them brainlessly now. But once you can use them brainlessly, a lot of things come for free. Yeah. I think the reason this is actually called Burkholder's inequalities instead of just, you know, trivial lemma is that in the classical case, this is actually quite non-trivial. Corollary, classical Burkholder 
inequality. If you just take a scalar valued LP bounded martingale, on a probability space, then the supremum of the norms of Fn in Lp is equivalent to, up to a constant depending on P, the square function of the martingale. The square function of the martingale differences. And we already have the whole proof of that. It's equivalent to the Rademacher average and the Rademacher average of, an L, of a scalar valued LP function is just a, a square function in LP. And this is, a, this is a classical result in probability. I mean, the first time this was proven, it was a big deal. Like you've got corresponding things for continuous time as well that we haven't proved. I think this is Burkholder Davis Gundy in continuous time, but at least in discrete time, I think the first was probably Burkholder. And for us now, it's just a trivial, concept, a trivial consequence of all the stuff we've done. So. I'm happy with that. We've proven a lot of things just gradually and finally a bunch of stuff just comes out for free. This is the um, growth and dig philosophy of mathematics. You do a bunch of stuff until everything just follows. Right. All right. One last thing I want to show, which is gonna tie together all the stuff we've done today. Um, these things we did today seem somewhat unrelated, right? We showed that L1 wasn't UMD, and then we showed Burkholder's inequality, which didn't have anything to do with the failure of L1 being UMD. We're going to do a result now that ties both of these things together, which is good. Uh, UMD implies the right on Nicodian property. <laughs> so we had this whole discussion of the Radon Nicodemian property and all of its equivalent characterizations and had this whole discussion of UMD and Burkholder's inequalities and stuff like that. It's time to tie it all together. Okay, so let's first wrong color of the day. Suppose X is UMD. And aiming for a contradiction Let's suppose that X doesn't have the right on nicotine property. Now, remember, we have like five different equivalent characterizations of right on nicotine. The question is, which one are we going to use? Right on nicotine was equivalent to Martingale convergence properties. It was equivalent to every bounded set being dentable, but it, it was also equivalent to the non existence of separated trees. So, this is going to be the thing that's useful to us. X is not right on nicotine. So, we're going to take a bounded separated tree and we're going to work with that. So X contains a delta separated tree in its unit ball, B of X, for some delta. X contains delta separated trees for every delta, but you have no control on how big the bounded set is that corresponds to it. But you can rescale and say, let's take the unit ball to some small delta. There's a delta separated tree in there. What does that mean? It means that there exists an LP bounded uh, martingale F dot valued entirely in the unit ball of X such that the difference sequence which is equal to the LP norm of F say, oh, sorry, DFN. If I take the LP norm of one of the differences, this is the LP norm of FN minus FN minus one. And delta separatedness says that this is greater than or equal to delta in norm everywhere for every omega in the space. So in particular, this LP norm is greater than or equal to delta. Delta is very small, but it's it's not zero, right? That's the key thing. Delta is very small. We don't have any control on how small delta is, but it exists. We don't need to know what it is. This is true uniformly in N. So I would say for all N greater than or equal to one because DF zero is just F zero and it says nothing. 
we're going to fix a natural number n and define a linear map t from the n-dimensional L infinity space into LP valued in X on some probability space that I'm not mentioning. Usually it would be quite difficult to find an isometric embedding of L infinity spaces into your LP space, right? You're not gonna be able to do this in general, but we're gonna do it with the help of this delta separated tree. We define T of a sequence A to be the sum over N of a n d f n. This is going to be our nice embedding of L infinity into L p x. Of course, showing it's an isometry is not going to be as easy as this L one argument we did. So we need to evaluate this norm here, which is the norm of this Martin girl in L p. And ordinarily, we might have trouble evaluating that, but we just showed how to evaluate LP norms of Martin Gales. We have Burkholder's inequality up to a constant depending on P and X. We assumed X was UMD. This is important here. This argument doesn't work if you just assume X is not Radon Nicodem. You have to also assume the UMD property to make this argument work. Burkholder tells you that this is the Rademacher norm of the different sequence. Like that. And by the contraction principle, this is bounded by the L infinity norm of the sequence, which is what we want because that's where the sequence lives, times the Rademacher norm of this Martin Gale difference. And using Burkholder again. <coughs> This L infinity norm stays there, and then you get Fn. And because the martingale is valued in the unit ball, this is less than or equal to one, because point-wise it's less than or equal to one, and then you integrate that over omega, you take the LP norm, whatever. This is just bounded by the L infinity norm of A. So this is a T is bounded. Not that it's an isometry yet, but that it's bounded. That's a start. So T is bounded, in particular, it's bounded uniformly in N. So the norms of these operate, T depends on N, I should say, we'll call it T sub N, just to be precise here. Yeah, T sub N is bounded uniformly in N. We need to show that T sub N is actually an isometry uniformly in N. And in fact, it is. So let's do the other direction. So we need to estimate the, the L infinity norm of A in terms of the LP norm of Tn of A. So let's fix a K and let's look just at the norm of A sub K and then we take the supremum of all K and get the L infinity norm of A. Quite simply, this is less than or equal to delta to the minus one, which is potentially very large, but finite. Times this difference term here just by the separatedness. If we expand out this norm, this is just absolute value of AK times the LP norm of DFK, and that's greater than or equal to delta by the separatedness of this martingale. Just this thing up here. So you can take delta over to the other side and get this estimate here. So we have just, just one term of the martingale here. And so if we use the contraction principle, contraction, this is bounded by the, the Rademacher norm because you can take the sequence which is zero everywhere except at one of the components, right? Or this is using that um, LPX as cotype infinity. If you remember what cotype was, every Banach space is cotype infinity. Then you use Burkholder Well, do I keep that there? Yep, by Burkholder, this is the norm of the sum from n from zero to n of a n d f n, just in LPX. 
so the, the norm of the martingale. Should I have said this is k is less than or equal to n, let's say, just to make this precise. So then we're only looking at the Rada market average up to n so that the supremum is the nth term. And this is the norm of Tn of A because that's Tn of A by definition. So this says that T sub N is an isometry of L infinity N into LPX for all N. And now we can finish the job. We assume that X was UMD. So the LP, the UMDP constant of X is what we need to look at. This is equal to the UMDP constant of LP of X. This is an exercise somewhere in the notes. Not too difficult to show. This is then bounded from below by constants depending on P and X and Delta, but not on N of the UMDP constant of L infinity N. Now we haven't estimated that one directly, but we do have this duality result, which says that X is UMD if and only if X dual is UMD. But in fact, what that estimate says is that the LP constant, I mean, the UMDP constant of X is the UMDP prime constant of X dual. So this UMDP constant of L infinity N is the UMDP prime constant of L1 N. And we know that it's greater than or equal to some constant times log N. For all n. And this goes to infinity. So this tells you that x is not UMD, but we assume that x was UMD. Right? So that's a contradiction. So that contradicts the assumption that x doesn't have the Radon nicotine property. So x actually does have or is RNP. So UMD implies a Radon nicotine property. Um, this is not really the, the canonical way of proving this, actually, because you can say a lot more. Um, I'm not going to prove the theorem in this course, but one theorem is that UMD implies reflexive. And we know that that implies rather nicotine. We know reflexive spaces have the rather nicotine property. But showing reflexivity of UMD spaces, it, it's not insanely hard, but it's harder than, than I want to spend time on. <laughs> it's much easier to use this quick argument and show that it at least implies the radon nicotine property without too much effort. Once you know that L1 is not UMD and once you know that once you've got the Burkholder's inequalities, they let you easily just construct an isometry from finite dimensional L infinity spaces into LP of X uniformly in the dimension. Yeah. I think that's all for today. Are there any questions about that? Oh, sorry, I forgot an example I needed to give. One quick example. Uh, little L1, L1 of N. It has the Radon nicotine property. It doesn't have UMD. Keep that in mind. UMD implies Radon nicotine property. The converse is not true. L1 is, this little L1 is RNP because it's a separable. Maybe I can spell separable properly a separable dual space. It's the dual of C0. Separable dual spaces have the Radon nicotine property. They don't need to have UMD, of course. Yeah, um, Calvin says injection, not an isometry. It is an isometry. Um, what's the, the issue here? So I guess you mean it's an isometry up to some constant. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, it's not an isometry, it's an isomorphism. Which we don't care about, right? It's an isomorphism uniformly in N. It's not an isometry, yeah. it's certainly not an isometry. How do you see the norm is preserved? The norm's not preserved, it's an isomorphism. The norm yeah, is preserved an... up to constants from above and below, right? Boundedness is the constant from above, the constant from below is the fact that it's invertible and the inverse is also bounded. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I, I'm saying isometry and no, it's on isometry, yeah. yeah. 
Excalibur. just deltas there. I mean, the, the norm is like controlled by delta inverse, which is huge, right? Generally. All good. Thanks for that. That's a good point. I don't want to say the wrong words. I think I got confused because in the argument with L1, that was actually an isometry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Are there more questions? No. Well, if there are no, no questions directly to this, I have maybe a more philosophical question, just following yep. on our, what we discussed in the break. Uh, so there's this um, uh, recent paper in the annals proving that Rademacher type is inflow type, right? Yep. And yep. Uh, the point of inflow type is it's a, it's a perfectly metric space property. It has nothing to do with the linear structure of yep. the Banach space. So then uh, just thinking of it, are you aware of some purely metric space properties that are describing either UMD or R? Yeah, the, the metric characterization of UMD is what you're asking about. Is there a characterization of the UMD property that doesn't use the linear structure of the Banach space, but only the metric structure or the Lipschitz structure? This is a famous open problem. Uh -huh. And yeah. same for RNP, I suppose. I'm not sure about RNP. I, I don't know enough about the Rodin. But we did have these dentability, but they still require- That uses, conve convexity. That uses convexity, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know about Rodin nicotine property. I, fact is, I don't know much about the Rodin nicotine property, to be honest. Like, yeah. I've said it before, I don't use it in my work anywhere. Like I use UMD and I know some stuff about UMD. Yeah, metric characterization of Rodin Nicodem. I haven't heard of it. Um, maybe there isn't one. <laughs> maybe there's provably not one, but I don't know. But yeah, for UMD, this is actually, this is a very interesting open problem. I think some people have worked on this. I don't think there was an answer. Um, uh, hey, Christoph, um, how readable is that paper? The, the uh, archive one, the annals one? Yeah, I, I have read this one. Have you read this, Christoph? I have browsed through it very quickly and may even say something about UMD. But, I, mean, uh, no I can say that I have actually yeah. read and understood the whole paper. So maybe I can comment on this <laughs> rather than Christoph. Um, it is readable. You can go and read it now. Yeah. Right. At this point, you've, you could, there's some results that have to be taken on faith that we haven't proven, but it's pretty well written. And actually the argument's not, in, not it's not easy, but it's not outrageously difficult. I guess that's why it's an annals paper. Like they just yeah. managed to introduce this fundamental new idea that was good and simple and worked. Yeah. We could, yeah I, actually, I wanted to do it in this course, but we have to do too much material. Yeah. It's a really neat, the inflow type is a really neat characterization. You, you're sort yeah. of embedding the humming cube and you look at neighboring corners and diagonal corners and you compare yeah. that. Yeah. It's, you see how the, uh, non-linearity comes in there but this yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, that, I think in the and you think it, it smells yeah. like one could be doing something like this for umd but of course there's not even a conjecture unlike in the, um, the inflow yeah the conjecture this, about inflow yeah. has been around for a long time at least right? yeah. but here inflow defined inflow type and proved that what was it router marker type implied inflow type or was it the other way around he proved one of the directions. It's equivalent like, now. I forgot what. It's equivalent now, but inflow proved one of the directions when it was defined. Yeah. yeah. But it just took over 30 years to do the other direction. Yeah. Very interesting. I might, um, I don't know, maybe it's like a special last lecture or something in the course. Maybe I'll give a little overview of that paper or something. That could be a bit of fun. If time allows, it would be great. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. That, that's, that's right, Calvin. And flow. Yeah. E -N -F -L -O. N -flow, yeah, the famous N flow. Yeah. I don't know any other N flows, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the picture of him with the goose? Yeah. Yeah. It's his it's Wikipedia photo. Oh, sorry. It's not N flow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it could have been. Yeah. Maybe I'll put the reference just in the chat very briefly. Um, Rider market type. See you later, guys. Have a good day. Yeah. Um, just typing this in the chat. Router marker type implies inflow type. I forgot the names of all the, I know the names of two of the authors. Who is it? So who's the first author? Christoph, do you remember? It's uh, Alex Wolberg and Pata Ivanishvi. Oh yeah, I know, I know these two. 
As you the third one. Is that the third one? Let me yeah, see. there's a third one. The first author. <laughs> first. Okay, okay, okay. Um, oh, Ramon van Handel. Van Handel, that's it. Yeah, in case anybody wants to go look up this paper that we're talking about, that's quite interesting. That's the name. I think that's the name. They're the authors. Yeah. From this year. Best paper of the year, probably. Yeah, the lecture is done. People can go. <laughs> We didn't cleanly end it, but it's finished. <laughs>